Hey, get your Bibles out. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to do something kind of special today. I want to talk to you about a very special meal. It's, it's great. You know, we're really the only creatures on the planet that can share really in a meal the way that we do. Jen and I have two golden retriever puppies. One's 80 pounds, one's 70 pounds. And they love to eat, and they love to eat together, but it's not like they really share in a meal. When, when we share in a meal, it, there's like connection, right? There's, there's, there's relationship. There's, there's a love there. There's a belonging there. It's like when you invite someone over to your house, usually you invite them over to share in a meal, when we have birthdays, there's a birthday party and there, there's usually a, a meal involved. Or when there's a, a wedding, there's always this great wedding reception and usually there's a meal involved. But there's also this tension. There's also this conflict that can go on during a meal. You ever notice that? Like, have you ever been with somebody at the dinner table and, and it's just they've been driving you crazy all day long? Don't look at them right now. Just pinch them a little bit. But there's, it can be awkward. It can be, it can be painful sometimes. But definitely, there's this place where a meal can actually bring a lot of power to relationships. For the rest of this talk, I want to talk about a very particular kind of meal, the meal that we're actually going to practice taking together later on in the service We've been doing this series called Works in Progress, where we're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can be a better Christ followers so that we can live moment to moment each and every day of our lives more in the reality of the kingdom of God. And so today we're going to be talking about one of the oldest practices in the church that we know. And it's not about music. It's not about praying prayers. It's not about taking up an offering. It's not even about the sermon. It's about a meal. And it really shouldn't be all that surprising because if you know much about the Bible, you know that throughout the scriptures, there are these amazing meals. When a birthright's been passed from one generation to the next, they would celebrate this meal there in the Old Testament. Another time in the Old Testament when temple sacrifices were made, very often, in fact, all the time, there would be a meal taking place after that. When God's people celebrated how God delivered them from the hand of the Egyptian pharaoh from the, the land of Egypt, and they, they celebrated this whole idea of Passover, they didn't just celebrate with songs and prayers, they celebrated with a meal. In the New Testament, the same pattern, same significance as the Old. Interestingly enough, if you read through the Gospels, you'll actually see Jesus, either he is you know, going to a meal, or he's at a meal, or he's coming away from a meal. Everything's wrapped around having a meal with other people. He's at the house of this, this guy named Simon the Pharisee, and there's a meal. He's over at the house of, of Mary and Martha, who's preparing a meal for him. Or he goes over and he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. In every one of these different stories, you'll find something significant happens to the person who's actually sharing a meal with Jesus. It's not just that we hear a sermon. It's not just when we listen to this great music. But something happens at the table of Christ. The most significant meal Jesus ever shared was at a night with his best friends. He's in the upper room, and it's the night before his arrest and later crucifixion. And Jesus is with his, his, his disciples, and they thought that they were actually going to be, you know, sharing a meal over the traditional Passover. They had no idea that they were going to celebrate something that God was going to do in the future. Jesus passed bread and wine and he spoke of his body. He spoke of his blood that would be poured out. And his disciples, his best friends on the planet were looking at him with just like bewilderment. What's going on, Lord? And he says this, he says, do this in remembrance 
of me. He says, do this and remember me. In fact, when Jesus gave his disciples this moment to reflect on his death and resurrection and what it meant for their lives, he didn't just give them this theory to ponder. He actually gave them a meal to practice. And for the last 2,000 years, followers of Jesus have been remembering him and practicing this meal for a very long time. Lots of people have talked about the debate over what this means. We call it communion. We call it the Lord's Supper. A lot of people are, are wondering, what is the meaning of this meal and how is Jesus present, really, in this meal? People have a whole bunch of different, you know, you know, different ideas about that, but really, one thing's for sure. This meal is more than just a symbol. It's more than, than a memory. It's more than a ritual. It's actually the place where we find grace. This meal is actually the place where we find community. This meal is the place where we find the good news of Jesus, and it gets experienced in the people who partake in it. In fact, if you misunderstand the meal of Jesus, really, you run the risk of misunderstanding why Jesus came in the first place. And that's what's happening in this, this first century church in, in this little town called Corinth. They had this, this problem. And Paul's writing letters to different churches. And in this letter to the church in Corinth, he talks about one particular issue on how they're, they're taking the Lord's Supper. In this church in Corinth, there are a number of things that they were doing wrong. There was like division. There was sexual indiscretion. There were, they were suing each other, if you can believe that. Suing each other within the church. This was not a good picture of Christian community. But Paul gets really upset. He uses his toughest words when he starts talking to them about what they were doing through this time of the Lord's Supper of Communion. So we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 17. He says this, In the following directives, I have no praise for you. That's a great way to kind of start out, right? It's like, the next few words that I'm going to say are not going to be good. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been no differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. No doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. He says, your church services are doing more harm than good. I mean, those are, those are tough words for people who are trying to go to church. Let's look at this a little bit. What's going on with this meal? What's happening here? In the ancient days, back in Paul's day, they didn't meet in these large auditoriums and take this meal together. They actually met in homes. And they would, they would sing together in the homes. They would read scripture together. They would, someone would be there to actually teach and interpret that scripture. They would pray together. And they would always always, always share in a meal. It would take place in this dining room. And the name of the dining room back then was called the triclinium. The triclinium was a place where they would actually have these couches around this common table area. It would accommodate about 10 to 12 people. And these people would just sit around and they would, you know, they would recline and they would eat around this table. And, and, and you know, it was uh, just a select few. Now, a lot of times there would be more people than like 10 or 12. Where would they go? Oh, well, they went out to this place outside called the atrium. That could accommodate 30, 40 people. 
And what was happening is there was a lot of things going on within this, this whole idea in this culture that where you sat at this table was how important you were. We've been talking about through weeks past that in Corinth, it's all about status. It's all about where you are climbing the ladder. So it was really important where you sat at the table. Some of you remember how Jesus' disciples will argue, well, well, who's going to sit at his right hand? Who's going to sit at his left hand? Because it was really important to them. But if you look at what Jesus would do when he would go to somebody's house, often he would talk to people about how, you know what, it's not important this, the, to sit in a place of honor. Why? Because he was more about people. People mattered to Jesus. Apparently, this whole dynamic that was going on with the culture where the rich and, and the, the people who were kind of the important people were in the common table area, and everybody else, the poor and not so important people, were out in the atrium. This was actually happening in the church. The rich and respectable dining inside, the poor and less reputable were dining outside. Well, sure, everybody was invited. Everybody got to be a part of the service, you know. It wasn't like they were missing the music, or it wasn't like they were, they were missing the sermon, or it wasn't like they were missing the scripture, but everybody was really doing this wrong with the food. What was going on was the rich and prominent, they arrived earlier, they were getting their fill, and then the people who were left out in the atrium would be coming in and they'd be like, oh, what's left over? And hardly anything would ever be left over. Sometimes nothing, and they would get nothing. What's the big deal about that, though? It's just food. For Paul, this was a huge deal. In verse 26, he says, Do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? In other words, he's saying, what you're doing, you're casting a shadow on everything that Jesus has taught you, everything that I have taught you on what the church needs to be. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you're discrediting everything that we are trying to teach the world and how to be different. And it all goes back to this table and how the, they're allowing these things like the wealth and status and, and the social and cultural norms to determine who's worthy and who's not, you know, who's educated and who isn't, who matters and who doesn't, who's on the inside and who's on the outside. I don't know about you, but it really reminds me of growing up in school. You know, it reminds me of the school system. Teachers have a certain curriculum that, t that the students are supposed to learn. You know, we're supposed to have certain standards of learning math and science and language arts and all this. But there's an undercurrent curriculum that goes on in school, isn't there? There's a secret curriculum going on with all the kids. Who's cool, who's with it, and who's not cool, and who's not with it. There's this secret curriculum. I can still remember my first day of seventh grade. Walking into the lunchroom, and there are all the cool kids sitting on one table. And everybody else is just kind of scattered in all these other parts of the table. Now, me being a choir boy at seventh grade, where do you think I sat? Right. Why do you laugh? I was at the... No, I was in one of the scattered tables. Of course I was. Here's the thing. Paul is saying the church has this secret curri curriculum... The church has the same kind of curriculum going on that's going on in the culture. You know, who has status and who doesn't? We see this not in the singing time, maybe. We don't see it during the sermon time, but boy, we sure see it at the time at God's table. Who sits at your table? Think about that in your life. Who sits at your table in that vulnerable space right next to you? Because whoever sits next to you at your table really reveals a lot about you and who you are. Think about it. People in the church tend to divide people up into two different groups. We tend to divide people up in us and them. Us. Fun. Our friends, 
people we get along with, people who are a lot like us, people who think like we do and, and talk like we do and live like we do. And then there's them, those people. You know, those are the people who look different. They talk the wrong way. They live the wrong way. They listen to the wrong music. They think the wrong way. Them are the people who are promiscuous. Those are the people who are liberal, way too liberal. Or those are the people who are conservative, way too conservative. Everyone has their list of us and them. We all do. While we might not mind being in the same room with those people or, or sharing a meal even with those people, when it comes down to it, when I have my friends, those people that I associate with, those people that I sit in the junior high lunchroom in my life with, those us and them people, who is sitting with you? Let's not even get started about our prejudices. Let's not even get started about our, you know, our preferences. That's when the us and them start to really show up. And that's why Paul says, what, shall I praise you for this? You want a pat on the back for that? I mean, no. Says, this isn't acceptable. This is not what the church of God is supposed to do. If you think about it, our church can have the best, most eloquent vision statement. We could have the best, you know, the, the best music, the best retreats, the, the shortest sermons on the planet. And still, still we could do more harm than good if nothing we do is address this, this secret curriculum that goes on. <laughs> what does it mean to prepare for this table? Paul says in verse 28, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink, those who come to the table, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. Wow. Uh, those are pretty hard words. Paul is saying this meal at this table, it isn't just a private thing between you and God. This is actually something between you and me, you and each other. It's about discerning the body of Christ. In other words, looking at the secret curriculums going on within the church. Where do we have an us and them in the church? Where do we have an us and them in our hearts? Where is the prejudice? Where is the judgmentalism? Where is the self-righteousness? Where is that lack of love? Where is the us and them? By the way, the reality is, it's not just out there outside these walls. This happens here too. Here's what the church at Corinth needed to come to grips with. There's no politics or education system that can fix this. There's no, you know, technology or, or there's no social media that can fix this. You know who can fix this? Just one person, and his name is Jesus Christ. These things are so embedded in us that, that we can't do this on our own strength. His broken body, his shed blood, were all about this new kind of curriculum. We could call it kingdom curriculum where we think about kingdom-mindedness on how he would want us to live in the kingdom of God. That's why this meal is so important, which brings us back to Paul's words, these familiar words. If you've ever been a part of a communion service, you've probably heard these words before. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, hear this next part, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a little ironic to me, this meal with the disciples was called the Last Supper when really, in all truthfulness, it's become the first supper, the first meal of its kind on this planet, kingdom curriculum. I want to walk through three elements of kingdom curriculum with you 
for our church and how we can make a difference in our culture today. You might want to write this down. Number one, his table is a place where everyone is welcome. It's a place where everyone's welcome, regardless of what you've done, what you have believed, or who you were in the past. In fact, in the ancient world, in the act of sharing a meal with somebody, it was all about accepting that person. Accepting them not only into your home, but accepting them as a friend. Accepting their lifestyle. Calling them brother or sister. If you had an enemy and you wanted to make amends with that person back then, you didn't just spit and shake hands. You shared in a meal together. It was that significant. By the way, that's why the religious leaders of the day were so mad at Jesus. Because he was always sharing meals with people who were sinners or tax collectors. And it was Jesus' way of saying, hey, I accept you for who you are. Ticked them off. In fact, at Jesus' Last Supper, he offered the bread and the cup to that one person who he knew ahead of time this would happen. He offered it to Judas, this follower who had already decided to betray him. And my friend, he offers it to you and to me still today. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, no matter what has gone on in your life, no matter what mess you have ever had in your life, Come to my table. It's time to eat. Because grace is the place where everybody is welcome. Number two, this table is a place where nobody is perfect. This table is a place where nobody gets to pretend. You know, we have to admit it at the table. There's no pretending. Everybody is welcome to the table, but guess what? Not everybody is ready for the table. Judas was offered the bread. He rejects it. Why? Because he had a different agenda than surrendering his will to Jesus. What's your agenda when you come to the table? I mean, we really have to look carefully at our hearts as well. Paul says this in verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He doesn't say, hey, you come proclaiming how great you are. He doesn't say, hey, you need to compare yourself and make yourself puffed up compared to some people around you. And it's not about pretending or being better than you actually are. By the way, we do that all the time, don't we? We like to come into a church. We like to come into Westgate sometimes. And we like to pretend. We like to put on a mask. We like to put on a smile when we don't really feel like smiling, do we? We've put on this facade. We are faking it. There's a story of a college student who was accused of cheating on a test. And his professor decided to bring him in and actually, you know, talk to him about it. And the professor says to him, hey, I think you copied your answers from the student sitting next to you. And why do you say that? The student says, well, because you, you guys got a problem wrong. And he's like, so, so what? I mean, everybody gets problems wrong. Could have been a total coincidence. Yeah, you got the same problem wrong. Well, so what? It could have been a, a total coincidence. He said, yeah. I don't know, because the student sitting next to you wrote, I don't know the answer, and then you wrote, I don't know the answer either. <laughs> the fact is, none of us want to admit that we need to come clean. None of us want to admit that we have issues. None of us want to admit that we have these this really messed up life or we have a, a marriage that's just kind of struggling or maybe even on the rocks, maybe it's severed completely. We don't want to let people know that. God forbid we be real in church because, you know, we got to wear our nice clothes and we got to make sure that people know that everything's okay. You know what? Everything isn't okay. It isn't okay. The truth is, everything is not okay. I'm not okay. You're not okay. And the good news is, there is grace for you. And Jesus invites you to his table because he died in your place. He died for your sins, not because you're doing okay, but precisely because you're not doing 
okay. And accepting an invitation to this meal is basically saying, hey, I want to come clean before you, God. I want to take off my mask. I want to be a genuine, real person admitting I'm not okay. Because so often we do communion in larger group settings like this, we miss how personal, we miss how vulnerable this experience, this moment can be. Because communion reminds us that forgiveness from God is all about relationship. It's all about person-to-person relationship. This gets really deep in us. After Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus didn't pull him aside and said, confess right now. No, he says, come on, have some breakfast with me. And I tell you, when you have a meal with Jesus, it gets poignant, it gets deep, it gets personal. You can't hide at Jesus' table. This meal is for people who are broken and who know it. Number three, this table is where true community is possible. It's where true community can happen. In other words, there's no more them. Paul writes these words in verse 33, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Do this together. And the point is that whether we have, you know, juice or we have wine in the communion cup, it's not a matter if it gets passed to you or you come up front to take it. The point is that we eat together at the same level at the foot of the cross where the poor are next to the rich, where the uneducated are next to the educated, where the the black and the white and the brown are all sitting together, where the older generation and the younger generation are standing as one. Not just as people who happen to attend the same church service, but as people who actually are invited by the same host. Amen? As friends sharing the same table. Because at at Jesus' table, there's no them. There's only inclusion. There's only us. People being loved deeply, people broken deeply, all of us needing grace. There's no other table like this on the planet, Jesus' table. In a moment, we're going to share this meal together. The table's been set, the words have been read, now it's time to look deep into your hearts. If you're not okay and you know it, Listen, if you're not okay and you know it and you're willing to sit next to people who know that they're not okay, somebody on your left and somebody on your right, and if you know that you need a Savior and you know that that Savior needs to be Jesus, the table is for you. Here's what's really cool about this. When we take communion, we're not just taking a moment to look back. We're also looking ahead. We're also looking forward because it's when Jesus talked about heaven, he would often describe using this image as a feast. Nobody deserves the feast. You can't buy or earn the feast. It's just something that, that you get when you come home. When prodigals come home, they're not just welcomed. They're given this great feast. So I want to read you this this sobering story. The writer is Philip Yancey. He writes it from one of his books. It's called What's So Amazing About Grace. And I just, when I I was reading this, I I wanted to, to read this to you. I think it sharply illustrates what we're talking about. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just above the Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, they tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, the length of her skirts, and they ground her a few times and she seethes inside. I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument 
And that night, she acts on a plan that she's mentally rehearsed scores of time. And she runs away. She's visited Detroit only once before, on a bus trip with her church youth group. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, he buys her lunch, and arranges a place for her to stay. This man gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. Ah, the good life continues. One month, two months, a year. The man with the big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. Since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives now seem so boring and provincial that she can hardly believe she grew up there. After a year, the first sallow signs of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days we can't mess around, he growls. And before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple tricks at night, but they don't pay all that much. And all that money goes to support her drug habit. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside the big department stores. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl lost in a cold, frightened city. She begins, she begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty and she's hungry. She needs a fix, you know? And she pulls her legs, she pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspapers. And she's put them atop of her coat to keep warm. God, why did I leave? She asks herself and pain just stabs at her heart and she's sobbing. She knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she just wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without a message the first two times, but the third time she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up on your way, and I'm going to be there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus. It takes about seven hours for a bus to get from Detroit to Traverse City. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan, you know. What if her parents are out of town and miss her message? I mean, if, even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. Her th thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech she's prepared for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? And she says these words over and over and over. She hasn't apologized to anyone in years. And when the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing in protest, the driver announces in a cranky voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks, that's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her life. She checks herself in her compact mirror. She smooths her hair and licks the lipstick off of her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice if they're there. If they are there. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect and not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepare her for what she sees. For there in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan stands a group of 40 family members Brothers and sisters, great aunts and uncles, cousins and grandfather, and even a grandmother to boot. They're all wearing ridiculous looking party hats and blowing noisemakers. And taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a, 
is in the terminal is a computer-generated banner that reads, Welcome home. And out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She looks through tears and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry, I know. He interrupts her. Hush, child. We've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. Baby, a banquet's waiting for you. This is just a taste of the kind of meal that we experience when Jesus, he prepares a table for each one of us for people who don't deserve what we are getting. When we come to this table remembering all that Jesus gave in order for us to be able to have a life with him, we don't just look back. We don't just examine our hearts. We do those things. Those are important. But we look ahead. Like each one of us as prodigals, all the prodigals of the planet look to Jesus. Jesus looks at them and he says, come on home. It's time to eat. Would you pray with me? Father God, we don't deserve this meal we're about to take. We haven't earned this meal that we're about to take, yet you still give it to us. You still give your table. All the prodigal totters, all the prodigal sons, everyone here represented as prodigals, we are not deserving of what you're about to give us. And we can't hide from your table. We want to be real at your table. Everything is not okay. We ask for your grace and your mercy at this table. We ask, God, that you would forgive us of the sin that binds us to ourselves and binds us to this planet and forgive us of everything that we have ever done so that we can be with you and live in your kingdom curriculum where there is no them, it's just us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says together, amen.